Right. Well, so just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody, especially during these incredibly difficult times that we are now a part of. Um, our world is rapidly changing and we're trying to respond to uh, all of these new difficulties uh, that we're coming up against. And I, and I say new, slightly tongue in cheek. Um, however, uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Sheila Addison um, uh, be able to provide this webinar for us. Um, I've known Sheila for several years now, um, and she is probably one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And I just feel incredibly honored that she has um, graciously agreed to share some of her wisdom with us. Um, she has lots and tons, tons and tons of experience in working with couples, um, especially couples who uh, don't fit within the, the mainstream or kind of the majority groups. Um, her work with uh, people who are non-heterosexual, non-binary, um, and outside the realm of uh, what most people would consider typical, um, especially with members of the kink community is just nothing short of breathtaking. However, that has extended well beyond into her work um, across multiple ways of providing therapy. Um, so I can say that we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, such an amazing speaker with us and to share some of her brilliance, especially in such a way as uh, something that we desperately need a little bit of extra guidance on right now. So um, without further ado, just wanted to kind of clear up some, some maybe some questions that some of you may have. This, uh, this uh, webinar will last until about 7.30. However, it is not worth any CEs at the current moment. Uh, this is pretty much just to be able to get as much information and to get the training that you need to provide the best kind of service as possible. Um, for any of you that know somebody that um, needed to get onto this training but maybe wasn't necessarily able to at the last minute, um, we are going to be recording this um, and we're going to make this recording available. So um, it will be able to uh, be able to share this information with lots of people um, in the coming days. So. Uh, if you look at near the bottom of your screen, there's an option that says Q&A. You can post any questions that you have during the presentation. Um, uh, as the uh, chair of the Couples and Interest Network, I will um, help to moderate some of those uh, questions. And then at the end, about the last half hour or so, I'll actually uh, be posing those questions to Dr. Addison. So that way there she can attempt to answer as many of them as time permits. Um, all right, I think that's about it. Um, are you good to go? I sure am. All right, well then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna turn off my screen and stuff. I'm gonna let you do your thing and I'm gonna sit back. I'm gonna take some notes myself. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, so thank you to uh, Christopher Bellis and the uh, Couples and Intimate Relationship Interest Network. I hope I have that right. Um, for inviting me to be a speaker at this webinar on working with couples in telehealth. Um, so the, the irony is uh, that although um, I've been a couple therapist for more than 21 years now, um, I uh, had never uh, actually done teletherapy with couples before uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, although I have been using computers for a very, very long time. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. So my name is Dr. Sheila Addison. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I specialize in couples, sex, and diversity. Um, I have completed uh, all three levels of Gottman Method couple therapy training uh, and currently being mentored, hopefully, toward certification. Um, and I do a lot of teaching and training on LGBTQIA issues, on couple therapy, on uh, human sexuality and sex therapy, and diversity issues. Uh, I also uh, as a kind of a side thing, I offer uh, the Ally Skills Workshop, which talks about how we use our privilege in situations where someone else is being targeted for uh, being marginalized. And I do that for community, corporate, and academic settings. Um, and I'll give you my email at the end of the presentation in case uh, anybody wants to get a hold of me. All right. So uh, we're here to talk about telehealth. And uh, first, of course, we should understand what is telehealth? You may see a bunch of different terms and they all mean approximately the same thing. Telehealth, teletherapy, telemental health, uh, and telemedicine. Um, but basically, Ben Caldwell, who uh, is now in charge of the uh, continuing education for simple practice, says, if you're in one place and the client's in another, and you're using technology to provide a healthcare service, you're 
probably engaging in telehealth. Now, the laws are going to differ um, on, based on your state or province um, about whether th that covers things like a phone call, um, but certainly where I am in California, uh, it covers any kind of technology used to do a distance session with a client. Um, in order to do telehealth, it's, it's really important, uh, just being comfortable with, with computers um, and being a good therapist is not sufficient to just jump in. And with everybody um, going to shelter in place, first in the Bay Area and then California and then many other states, um, there's been this huge wave of therapists going, I, I need to be able to do telehealth. Um, and so I have spent the past three weeks saying to people, slow down, and first of all, make sure that you know what your laws and regulations are. And I really have to hand it to AMFT, um, because we got this email a couple of weeks ago saying, MFTs, we are here for you. We have resources. And so um, if you Google AAMFT uh, coronavirus, it will take you straight to this page uh, where there's a message from Tracy Todd and then a whole bunch of resources. And um, right here where the arrow is pointing, it points to the coronavirus and state province guidelines for telehealth. And that will take you to a whole page of all of the links that AMFT could find listing, uh, linking to specific state by state, province by province uh, laws and guidelines. Um, because like our licenses, telehealth is regulated basically at the state level, not at the federal level. So you can't uh, assume that just because uh, you know, you're in Alabama and someone else is in Georgia that the laws are the same because they're not. Um, some states require a specific amount of training in order to offer any telehealth, um, and, and other states require no specific training at all. Um, states that have really tight regulations on telehealth, uh, I hear anecdotally, are opening them up a little bit because of this unprecedented crisis that we're in. Um, but uh, I just want to be clear, I am not a lawyer and I am not an expert in uh, the laws of any state. I'm you know, reasonably conversant with California, um, and I will try and make it clear that that's the perspective I'm speaking of, but, but you have to know what your state laws and guidelines are. Now, when we start talking about telehealth, um, to, for, to contradict myself and start talking about federal law for a minute, because there is federal law that matters here, um, we immediately run straight into the HIPAA monster. Um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, uh, has actually been the law of the land since 1996. Um, but an awful lot of therapists, particularly those in private practice, have managed to sort of um, uh, exist in a parallel world where HIPAA is not something that they've had to think about very much, and I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, the, Hi the HIPAA law, for our purposes, really has two parts that are important for us to know about. One is the privacy rule, which are the standards to protect personal health information. In other words, what information is protected and how it can be used and disclosed while allowing the flow of information that's needed to provide health care. That's just generally what do we have to protect and why. And then the security rule says how we have to do it when we're dealing with electronic media, like providing telehealth. It says what kind of safeguards have to be in place so that the important personal information is protected, all right? Now, this is not a webinar on HIPAA. I'm gonna actually talk about HIPAA for a little bit longer here, um, but it is not a webinar on HIPAA, and HIPAA opens up a whole uh, hornet's nest of um, questions that I strongly encourage you to find good, solid answers to. Um, places that you can get wonderful answers to your questions about HIPAA. Uh, Person-centered technology, which I'm gonna talk about a great deal throughout this. Um, oops, sorry, I wanna go back. Uh, the Zur Institute, which has terrific resources online, and then Simple Practice Learning. Um, also, this book by our own AMFT member, Lorna Hecker, H uh, HIPAA Demystified, uh, which you can get at uh, in any bookstore can order that for you. Um, and so if you are brand new to HIPAA, I very strongly recommend that you take, you know, even just a one or two unit uh, CEU on that and or get a copy of Lorna's book because it will really, I think, open up um, a lot of uh, areas that you want to look into. Um, the, the reason that therapists in private practice have been able to kind of pretend that HIPAA doesn't exist for a long time is that HIPAA 
only applies to what's called a covered entity. Um, and if you go to the government's website on HIPAA, it will direct you to this little interactive PDF that you can click through to find out, am I a covered entity? So if we were to, um, you know, go to this page and we looked at providers here on the left um, and you know, we said, yes, I am a, I am a private practice uh, therapist. I am a healthcare provider. Then it would ask us, does this person, business or agency, furnish, bill, or receive payment for healthcare in the normal course of business? Well, unless you're doing therapy completely for free, of course, you would, you would click yes. Um, does this person, business or agency, transmit or send any covered transactions electronically. Um, covered transactions mean health insurance uh, transactions. And then you either say yes or no. Now here's where an awful lot of private practice therapists have managed to uh, live in a world without, as if the world was without HIPAA for quite some time because they say, well, I don't take any insurance. And so I don't submit any covered transactions electronically. So if I click that no button, then it says this person, business, or agency is not a covered healthcare provider and is therefore not a covered entity. Um, even folks who do take insurance, um, many folks have decided, I'm going to stick strictly to paper billing, even though it has its drawbacks, because then I don't have to worry about being a HIPAA covered entity. Um, so here's the thing. Even if you're not a covered entity, you need to know about HIPAA because uh, our codes of ethics, although they certainly were drawn up originally in times when we did not have things like uh, video chat and texting and email, um, have been updated, ours in 2015, uh, in order to acknowledge the fact that we as therapists are supposed to be uh, the professionals in this area. We are supposed to be the one who knows better when it comes to protecting our clients' confidentiality and privacy, right? And so just like it's our job to secure our paper records in our offices, it is actually our job to know enough to secure our electronic communications with our clients. And so our code of ethics says it's the therapist or supervisor's responsibility to choose technological platforms that adhere to standards of best practices related to confidentiality and quality of service and that meet applicable laws. So what does that mean? Well, if you do telehealth and someone questions whether you are adhering to standards or best practices, and when legislators are writing laws covering things like telehealth, where do you suppose they look for guidance? They go to HIPAA and they say, you know what, the federal government wrote this huge set of laws and regulations over the course of years to set up the standards for what is an adequate level of privacy protection when you're doing electronic transactions. They might know something about it. And states are free to be more uh, loose with their laws than that. They're free to be more uh, regulated with their laws than that. But they tend to model their laws after HIPAA. And when uh, people are um, asked to account for their practice, for example, before an ethics board or in court, uh, they may ask, well, how did you decide to use this particular uh, tool, this particular platform? Why did you choose that one? Well, you explain yourself and they'll say, well, what, what standards did you use to evaluate whether that was good enough? And if you say, well, just, you know, it seemed pretty good to me, or, you know, my office mate said it was pretty good, they're probably going to come back and say, you know, why didn't you look at the HIPAA standards? And it's not going to matter whether you bill insurance or not, because they're going to say, here is a whole set of standards that your field has come up with. You could have used them. So, in getting going with telehealth for couples, um, we do need to know some things about HIPAA and what it means to choose the appropriate, uh, is particularly the appropriate software. Because to get going doing telehealth, we need to have software, we need to be able to figure out how to, how to use our, our forms with our clients, we need to have some equipment, and we need to have a good setting. And I'm going to talk briefly about all of those. The number one tech question from therapists that comes up on mailing lists and that I get in my inbox when people figure out I know something about uh, technology is, what program should I use for 
blank. What program should I use for my email? What program should I use for getting signatures? What program should I use for securing my computer, etc.? But what this question really means is, what free program should I use for blank? Because um, you know we hate paying for software. That's kind of uh, uh, you know become our expectation, right? Because Google is free and Facebook is free and WhatsApp is free. Uh, that we should get all of our platforms for free. And there are sometimes free options, but generally, um, free versions of things tend to not uh, have the standards that meet our needs. Um, and it goes back to this HIPAA rule about protected health information. Um, protected health information, or PHI, is any health information that can be tied to an individual. And there's like 18 categories of it. Um, and if you are in any way transmitting protected health information, which, by the way, includes the image of a person, which you're doing when you're video conferencing, right? Um, you need to have a business associate agreement signed with the company that that you're using their software. Um, the business associate agreement, and again, this is not a HIPAA seminar, all right? So then I'm gonna talk about this for one minute and then I'm gonna stop. Um, the business associate agreement is an agreement that you sign with any company who transmits or stores protected health information for you. And that means physically or electronically. So an example that was used in a training that I took was, Imagine for some reason that you had a really, really small office and you could not find room for a filing cabinet, but your uh, office mate next door actually had a little bit of extra space and said, you know, you can put your filing cabinet in my office. That's fine. That person is now storing protected health information for you. And if they, you know, open up the filing cabinet because they're using a drawer in it as well. And then they forget to lock it back up again. And they forget to lock their office door because their, their you know, mind is on something else that day. And they walk out and they leave that filing cabinet open and the door open. Uh, they have just created a, a, a breach of privacy for your clients. And so who's responsible for that, right? Let's say the worst possible thing happens. Someone comes in the office, they root through the files, they pull out a file, they take someone's personal information, right? And somehow that person finds out that their information was stolen and decides to sue you. Uh, who is responsible for that? Well, the business associate agreement is an agreement that says, hey, you're storing my stuff. You are promising me that you're gonna do a good job of it. Right? So if you had a business associate agreement with that person who is storing your filing cabinet, then you'd be able to say, I I'm really sorry, I was told that that would be stored in a way that was protected and I didn't have control over it. I hope that analogy makes sense because when it comes to electronic information, sometimes people's sense of like, well, where is this stuff gets a little fuzzy because uh, we can't see physical objects, but electronic files are treated exactly the same kind of way. So if I am allowing someone to transmit my client's image or to store information about my client, like their email address, and they screw up and they get hacked, I want to be off the hook for their security mistakes because I don't know how uh, Google secures their servers or Apple. I don't have any way to influence that. And so a business associate agreement covers me in case of a breach but it's often not available with the free version of a program or service. And so this leads to a really common mistake that I'm seeing as people rush to get online for telehealth, which is they're grabbing for the free version of programs to try and get up to speed and thinking, great, now I'm doing telehealth, except that they don't have a business associate agreement and so they're not HIPAA compliant. If you can't get a business associate agreement, and that's a specific document that they will email you uh, and, and perhaps you will both sign and that you will be able to download and even print out if you want. If you can't get one from a company whose product you're trying to use to handle client information, you probably shouldn't use it. And that includes things like email, texting, uh, cloud storage, including how you back up your hard drive if you store any client information on your hard drive. Uh, and that includes telehealth programs. Um, now, a couple of things. One is that the way that the HIPAA legislation was written, um, credit card companies are not included in this. 
your, your landline phone is not included in this, and your fax machine, because this was 1996, are not included in this. Um, so those pieces are, you don't have to worry about. Um, also, uh, legislation and courts seem to have held that clients have the right to consent to use normal email from the provider if we warn them about the risks and they agree to accept the risks. I will mention that more a little bit later when I talk about consents. Um, but for now, generally speaking, if you can't get a business associate agreement for a service, don't use it. And so one of the things that we have to think about just about the same moment that we go, well, what video chat, video conferencing service am I going to use? A question we need to answer at the same moment is how are you going to send and receive protected health information, right? Because we have to have clients sign documents like consents for therapy, and we want them to fill out information that tells us what's their phone number and what's their address and are they taking any medication? And all of that contains protected health information. So there's a wide variety of ways to do this, and I'm not going to advise you on one today. This is here is an example of why you should go get a training on telehealth if you haven't done it before is that you can use encrypted email you can use an encrypted cloud service uh, you can use practice management software that includes uh, a, a way of managing uh, client information client files an electronic health record or EHR. Um, this week I'm hearing a whole bunch of people say, oh, I'm sending my clients forms to them with DocuSign. Well, I spent about 45 minutes today on DocuSign's website and it looks to me like the free version of DocuSign does not come with a business associate agreement. You have to pay for uh, an enterprise version of it to get a BAA and I'm willing to be corrected on that, but that's what my research suggested today. Um, you know, one way to get clients to send you stuff is the good old postal mail. They can drop it in the mail and send it to you, and no one will blink twice. Um, if you're comfortable giving them your uh, home address, which I'm personally not, you could have them send it to you there. Uh, you could send it to a P.O. box, or you could have them send it to your office if you can go to your office and pick up your mail, which I'm still doing occasionally. But you've got to figure out how you're going to send and receive it. And then second, you have to figure out how you're going to store it because you're going to take notes from your sessions or write up session summaries. You're going to have these client intake forms or maybe client assessment forms. And if you're working from home, you can print it out and lock it up if you have a filing cabinet or a locking box or a locking envelope. You can save it on your computer, but then your computer needs to be locked up and secured in ways that are way beyond the scope of this webinar. Or you can save it in the cloud, in which case you need a business associate agreement. So lots of stuff to think about in terms of sending and receiving info and just managing the records as you do telehealth. And so if you don't make a plan for how you're going to handle information every step of the way, essentially what you're saying is, what, me worry? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about it when there's a problem. And that's not preparation, that's reaction, as we have learned during this coronavirus crisis, right? So we want to be prepared in advance. And that's why the number one thing I want you to take away from this telehealth webinar is if you've never done tele telehealth, take some telehealth trainings. Um, but the number two thing is how to do couple therapy. And I promise we will go there shortly. Um, so programs you can use to do telehealth. There are at this point two free programs. Uh, one is called Doxy.me, and the other is VC Clinic, uh, which is a version of VC that's available for private practice folks that is free and comes with a BAA. However, as of today, today is uh, March 30th, 2020, VC has currently suspended its free tier because so many people have signed up during this pandemic. So, uh, you and the past have been able to get a free business associate agreement with them. Right now, you can only get it through their paid version. Hopefully, in the future, they will go back to offering that. So, you can still keep VC, you know, in your list of resources. Um, but for today, if you want something free, it's doxy.me. Um, programs that are not free, and I'll say this, um, I have used all three pro I've used uh, Doxy.me, I've used VC for many years, and I'm now using Zoom for telehealth, um, and the quality is very different between the free versions of things and paid uh, 
paid services. Um, I'm having much better reception, much better picture and sound now that I'm on a paid service. Um, Zoom for telehealth is kind of confounding for folks because when you go to sign up, there's a free version, not compliant with HIPAA. There's a pro version, which is like $15 a month. And so it's like, great, I'm a pro. That's what I need. But it doesn't come with a business associate agreement. Then there's a business version, and that doesn't come with a business associate agreement either. You have to get a Zoom for telehealth account. And the way that they do their service right now, you can only uh, buy in with a minimum of 10 host licenses, which start at $200 a month, which is a lot for a private practice person. What I understand people do is uh, create an account and then lease uh, the host licenses to other folks. Now, if you're in an agency, you just get a set of licenses for your agency. Um, but I know private practitioners who've gone in together on group uh, you know, shares of the 10 licenses to make it you know, 20 or so dollars a month and affordable. Um, as far as I know, I am not a lawyer. I do not work for Zoom. As far as I know, that seems to be working fine for folks. Um, however, another option is supposedly to sign up with G Suite, which is the professional version of like Gmail and Google Docs and so forth. Supposedly this is $6 a month. Um, it then creates uh, a version of Google Hangouts, which they call Google Meetings, I think. Um, and that supposedly is HIPAA compliant. But your free versions of that software, Gmail and Google Hangouts, are not HIPAA compliant. Um, and then the third kind of thing you have is practice management programs, these electronic health records, simple practice, uh, Spruce, a lot of people are talking about this week, Therasoft, Theranest, they often come with a, a telehealth client kind of embedded in the software. Um, and you could look those up yourself to see what their charges are per month and if you want to use the services that they provide. Now, you may have heard that right now, because of the coronavirus pandemic, that there is no HIPAA. Um, and uh, that is true in a very limited way, you know? Um, it's kind of chaos, cats and dogs living together for people who um, have, have been following this stuff for years because all of a sudden, we've been trying so hard to be compliant, and now they're saying, you know, everybody in the pool, right? Um, and so the government has actually said, due to the crisis, there is a temporary suspension of penalties for the use of non-compliant tools. And the ones that they mentioned specifically are Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, and Skype. However, um, just because we can now use this software does not necessarily mean we should use this software. And you should think about it before you decide to jump in and adopt something. Um, why not go ahead and use something you know meets standards if it's available? What are you going to use after the crisis and the waiver is over, right? If, because many clients I predict are going to start to want to do more telehealth. Folks are going to want to use telehealth when they don't feel quite well enough to come into the office, um, but they still want to have their session and not cancel. Um, folks who drive a bit to us may say, can we just do telehealth? And everybody's going to have to make their own decision about that, but I imagine that it's a service that folks are going to want. And in choosing uh, services to use, um, personally, I would never uh, give private information about my clients to Facebook or uh, WhatsApp or Instagram or whatever, even if the government said it was okay, um, because they have notoriously terrible privacy practices. So if you really uh, are determined to use one of these products that is temporarily okay, um, the top contenders, as far as I'm concerned, would be Apple FaceTime, uh, because Apple actually is very secure and encrypted in their communications. Uh, and some people have said that it may be okay under HIPAA, even without a BAA. I'm not gonna rule on that, but, um, but it requires that both you and your clients have Apple products. You can't use them on Android or on a, a Windows PC. Um, or there is the app Signal, which is encrypted messaging that now has video, but uh, this is an app largely that's available for mobile devices, and using a mobile device uh, is not always ideal for telehealth, although we're not in ideal circumstances, so uh, everybody's just doing their best. Um, 
When we choose our telehealth program, uh, we need to then allow our clients to have informed consent for telehealth. And the laws are going to vary, again, state to state on what you have to say here. Go back to that page that AMFT has provided us. But generally, we need to have a specific agreement for them to receive services via telehealth. And often that requires us to do things like describe what services we're going to use, uh, tell people about the risks and drawbacks of telehealth. So for example, uh, we can no longer be wholly in charge of privacy and confidentiality because we don't control uh, the electronic connection. We don't control the setting that the client is in. And so it may be harder to keep it confidential. Um, we can get disconnected during sessions. It can be hard to, to talk if the connection is poor. It can be harder to manage emergencies when we're not in the same place. And although some studies have suggested that telehealth may be as effective as in-person health, there's still not a robust body of evidence out there, particularly when it comes to couples. And so we need to inform people about them. Um, many uh, jurisdictions require us to inform people about emergency procedures. Um, I think it's important that we should tell people what should happen if, we're gonna, if we have technical difficulties, et cetera. But you should see your state's provinces or laws. Um, and the two links at the bottom, person-centered technology and Zur Institute, both offer um, potentially uh, useful uh, kind of standard template forms for telehealth that you might or might not have to modify for your state's laws, but they're a place to start. Um, in California, there's very specific laws. We have to get very specific info uh, at the, the, con the informed consent process. Uh, and one of the things we have to do is we have to show that we made an effort to gather emergency resources. So my telehealth consent form says, what is the nearest hospital to the location where you will normally be for telehealth? That way, if there's some kind of an emergency, I have an idea of what hospital I might call them to get help. I also have them a designated an emergency contact that I could call, just like uh, your doctor's office might. And California also requires that every time we initiate telehealth, this is a phone call, a video chat, anything, every time, we have to verify our client's identity and their location. We have to assess whether they are appropriate for telehealth. Can they benefit from telehealth? And we have to take steps to protect their confidentiality and their security. Now, verifying a client's identity is pretty easy on video. We look at the person, we say, yep, you're my client. Um, but on the telephone, it can be harder. And so one technique that I have heard about for folks who are doing a lot of telephone therapy is when they are face to face with the client, um, ideally before we all had to shelter in place or now via video, um, you set up something like a code word or a code phrase. And so uh, one example could be that uh, the therapist says, every time we do a phone session, I'm going to ask you what color jacket you're wearing and you're going to answer purple. No matter whether you're wearing a jacket or not, what color jacket you're actually wearing, you're going to answer purple. And that's how I will know for sure that it's you. So that's the California law. What are your state's laws? Go look them up on that coronavirus page on the AMFT website. Um, other forms that I find helpful for telehealth. Uh, of course, I need my general consent for therapy if I'm starting with new clients. Uh, I need their information that, so that I can get a hold of them other ways and I have info about them. Uh, I send them a form about electronic payments and how I'm going to get paid and what the risks potentially are there and how I protect that info. I give them a social media policy uh, and a texting and email risk assessment and consent because, as I mentioned earlier, clients can choose to receive email and text messages that are just normal, that don't come through a particular program or a special app that they don't have to follow a link to get to, but we have to tell them what the risks are. And so I have a form that says, these are the risks of unsecured email. Are you interested in assuming them? Um, this is all stuff I learned about through trainings uh, various places. Person-centered technology um, is where I've done most training, and I recommend them um, quite highly. But you can learn about all of these kind of ideas, like a social media policy and texting and email risk, uh, by taking trainings. Now, we have to get paid somehow. Um, and so if we are not in the same place, we can have clients mail us cash or checks. Uh, not super safe to mail cash particularly, and of course we have to provide them an address. Um, or we can take credit and debit cards. And um, Square and Stripe are the two biggest processors. Uh, 
Practice management software like Simple Practice and Theranest have payment systems built into them that usually run actually on Square or Stripe. Um, and then there is Ivy Pay, which is an app that is built specifically for therapists that is built with HIPAA in mind that um, protects client information to a standard that is compatible with HIPAA. Uh, and that actually is, um, as far as I've been able to find, the best uh, uh, in terms of the, um, the amount that they take from each charge. Um, then there's uh, web-based things and app-based things like Venmo and PayPal. But notice I've got asterisks on Square, Stripe, Venmo, and PayPal. And that's because all of those services do things like they try and generate emails to clients or texts that say, you know, you've just made a charge with Dr. Sheila Addison. And if someone is not safe at home or not safe in their relationship, if someone has access to their phone or access to their email, is monitoring them, these kinds of responses may compromise their privacy. Uh, especially if we send people invoices, their privacy may be compromised. And none of these businesses that I have starred here are gonna give you a business associate agreement in order to cover those kinds of communications. So don't use them unless you're very clear about how the particular service you're using is locked down, and you may not be able to use all the features of the service uh, because they won't give you a BAA. Um, as far as I know, Ivy Pay is the only app that will actually give you uh, a BAA for covering transactions. Then you need equipment. And if you don't already have equipment, well, you're on a webinar, so what, how are you getting here? I don't know. Um, but you need a webcam that's either built into your laptop or separate on your desktop. Um, do not try to use your phone to do telehealth. The screen is too small, the processor is not fast enough, um, you will not get good quality uh, transmission with a phone. Clients sometimes want to use their phones for telehealth, I recommend against it, but any communication is better than no communication, especially in an emergency. Tablets, it depends. If you've got a relatively new one, you might get a pretty good connection. As long as you're using uh, Wi-Fi and not using uh, cellular signal. Um, but if you're using an older one, it might be kind of slow. Uh, you need a microphone and speakers. So again, those can be built in. Uh, they can be separate. You can use a headset. I'm using a USB, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm using a Bluetooth headset right now to record this today. And if you want to know what equipment to buy, the answer is don't ask me because I'm not an equipment reviewer. Um, you can go to places like the Wire Cutter, Consumer Reports, and even Amazon Reviews to look at what kind of equipment you might use and to make a decision on that. That's how I do it. Then when you set up your telehealth setting, you need to think about what's behind you. Um, what's good is some kind of plain wall or pieces of art. I have a kind of busy wall behind me here in my home. I have a pretty busy wall in my office as well, and clients are used to that in my practice. So that's why I didn't take all my art down, but some people like it to be very plain. Um, bad is sitting in front of a window, uh, in front of a long hallway or a doorway where people can see into other parts of your home or having other people behind you. Um, and if you, may, if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a, a guy who was a correspondent in, I think, South Korea who was trying to give a business report remotely, and his little daughter ran into the office and ran all over the office. Um, we are all dealing with that kind of stuff this month. And so honestly, some of us have had to ask questions like, maybe I should go into the office just to do telehealth because it's quieter and it's more private and I won't have uh, much public contact because it's my office, it's just me in there. Um, remember that you wanna light yourself from the front and the sides, never light from the back. This is what happens when you sit in front of a window. People say, oh, I'll sit in front of the window because it'll be a, there's an attractive view out back. But what actually happens is that you get this glare from the light source, the same if you have a lamp that's behind you. Make sure that you don't see your light sources in the camera. You also need to think in terms of your setup, how you're gonna control interruptions and protect client privacy. Can you lock the door to the room that you're sitting in? Um, are other people gonna be in the house? Um, I know people who are doing telehealth out of their garages and their sheds uh, and in a real emergency out of their cars. It's not a great long-term setup, but we're in an emergency here. Um, thinking about how to get your technical setup started, 
There's a list of things that you can find if you Google how to, uh, uh, how to troubleshoot telehealth. Um, these are some suggestions, things like restarting your computer, turning off other programs, closing things in your browser, sitting close to the Wi-Fi box, the router, or plugging into it directly. Uh, turning off notifications that might be going ping, 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 usually with a do not disturb setting, um, and don't allow your system to run system updates or antivirus things. Same for your clients. They need a device, they need a camera, they need mics, they need speakers, they need locations. Sometimes clients will want you to help them do this. How much help you give is really up to you, but you don't control their technical setup. So one thing I suggest to folks is that you consider doing a test run before your first telehealth meetings. You can either say, let's meet 10 or 15 minutes before the hour that we have you scheduled and uh, do a little tech run through, or maybe on a different day and time as you're trying to just figure out scheduling. Um, but remember, if we can't see and hear clients effectively, we can't assess them. We can't tell how they're doing. We can't tell if they're benefiting from telehealth says California, we always have to be attending to that. And so we need to be able to see and hear folks as well as we can. Um, I send folks a best practices list as well that says these kinds of things, you know, don't um, prop up, you don't try and hold your phone up with your hand like this because you can't do that for 45 minutes well. If you absolutely have to use a phone, um, either sit it up on something or use what like a, some kind of a holder or a tripod. And I always tell my clients, don't use a cellular connection because it'll eat up all your data. Um, you need to have a policy about what you will do if your sessions get disrupted by equipment or connection problems. How far into the session will you go ahead and bill for the whole session if the connection drops? You know, 25 minutes in, 45 minutes in to a 50 minute hour? When will you bill for a partial session? When will you say, you know what, let's just call this one, you know, a, a lost cause and let's try again another day, no charge. You should spell that out in your telehealth consent. And you should have a policy about how to handle dropped connections. If we get disconnected, do you call me? Do I call you? Um, if you're using a telehealth client like Zoom, you can only call from the, the therapist, but if you're using something like Google Hangouts in an, in an emergency, the client might be trying to get a hold of you while you're trying to get a hold of them. And if you can't get the video connection back, then what are you going to do? Are you going to phone? Are you going to text? Should they text you? Should you email them? What means are you going to use? Doesn't matter so much what you decide as, as that you have an actual policy and people know it's there so they can follow it. All right, let's talk about setups for couple therapy. Um, you can do couple therapy uh, with one laptop and people on a couch. You can do therapy with a laptop or a desktop on a table and chairs or a couch. Um, and you can do it with two people, two or more people, on different computers in different locations. And I'm going to show you examples of each here coming up. Um, this is what it looks like if you have a laptop on about an 18-inch coffee table, uh, and you have the client sitting about 48 inches back. That's measured from kind of their, their chest to the screen of the computer. So the laptop is sitting a little bit low uh, and about four feet back. And so um, uh, Russ and Bart here can sit a little ways apart from one another. They can turn toward each other and look each other in the eye. And I can still see them. I can't see as much as I would see in a session where I'd be able to see all the way down to their feet. Um, but I can see a great deal of their body language. Now, when people are on a desktop, a tendency is to try and sit at the desktop as if they're going to be typing, um, which they're not. They're not going to type. They're going to talk. Um, but if they sit up close to the keyboard like this, especially when you have two people, it's way too close. This is about two feet from the clients to the, uh, to the computer, laptop or desktop. And they're crowded in shoulder to shoulder, and I can only see them from the neck up. So if they are have, using a computer that's on a table, particularly a desktop that can't be moved easily, have them sit back 40 inches, 45 inches, same as if they, they were using a laptop and sitting on the couch. I've got them here in two chairs. Ideally, they would be rolling chairs so that they could reposition themselves a bit, kind of like they would on a couch. But these are just two um, dining chairs turned toward one another. And so again, I can only see them from about the chest down. 
Like they could, you know, pat each other on the knee or hold hands and do something that I can't quite see that I would maybe have liked to comment on, but I can still see them pretty well. And they could probably back up a little bit more here. They're just constrained, constrained by their space in this little test that we're doing. Now we have uh, Russ and, uh, and Bart on two different computers in two different locations. So Russ is on a laptop sitting on the couch in the front room. And you can see up across the top, Bart is back in the bedroom on a different laptop. Um, this is something you could also use if people are in two different homes, two literally physically distant locations. Um, you could also use it uh, if you're having trouble with sound. Sometimes when you have um, clients uh, getting your sound through the speakers and having their microphone on, it starts to echo back and forth. Um, and that's something that you can solve easily with um, uh, wearing a headset if you're just one person, but two people can't use the same headset. Now, if you have a headset that plugs into a headphone jack, you can get a splitter. I'm sorry I didn't put a picture of this in the slideshow. I should have. You can get a splitter that allows two people to listen to the same audio. And that's one solution for couples if you're getting echoes back and forth. But another solution is to go on different computers in different rooms if they have them. And so you'll see here, um, my arrow is pointing to that little clock in the upper right-hand corner because in the program Zoom, um, this is not an ideal kind of a look here because I, I can see Russ when he's talking, but I really can't see Bart very well. He's up at the top. And so I can switch views, which I'll talk a little bit more about screen setup later, but I can switch views to make everybody a little bit more equal. And so now I can see both of them approximately the same size. Um, an even better thing that I can do in this kind of a view is I can hide myself and then I just see my clients. And so this is what it could look like on two different computers. Now, when we get into different locations, we may get into law and ethics kinds of stuff because if people are in the same city, that's no problem. If they're in the same state or province, that's very likely no problem, although I wouldn't swear to it. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the law in all 50 states and all of the Canadian provinces and all of the counties and cities that there, that there are out there. But it's probably fine because, again, licensure goes state by state. But if people are in different states, that's where there's the potential for a problem because there's different laws and regulations for practice of telehealth in different places, right? I'm not going to go into all the differences here because I'm not an expert on that. But um, here is a link to ebglaw.com. Uh, they have an app called Telemental Health Laws, which you can download for iOS and Android. And they update it pretty regularly. And you can look and say, what is the law in my state? What is the law in this state where my client or one of my clients is traveling to or where they're sheltering in place right now? Um, and so you're going to have to check on that and see if you can actually do a session if someone is out of state. In, if one, of, one or both of your clients are in different countries, this creates a whole host of potential problems. Um, will your professional insurance cover services that are provided in another country? Uh, answer, if you use uh, um, uh, PCH, who we get a discount with through AMFT, uh, the answer is no. They will not cover you for any claims for services provided in other countries. Um, what are the laws and regulations about mental health and telehealth if they exist in that other country? Uh, and would you be violating them to do therapy with someone there? And what are the privacy rights and government practices in that other country? If one of your clients has taken a business trip to China, I would not recommend doing telehealth uh, where you are doing couple therapy with them and their partner because the Chinese government notoriously surveils all of the internet. And even if uh, the person in China could get onto a, a Zoom call or uh, a VC call, um, I can't promise you that they wouldn't be able to, um, to, to get a hold of that information somehow, and it might not be safe for people. Um, so if I don't know much about uh, the government somewhere, I'm certainly not going to do telehealth there. Now, during this crisis, people are asking, I heard something about how the rules about practicing across state lines are waived. 
And indeed, I put two uh, different URLs here. Um, one is at that EBG Law, the other is at AMFT. Um, and there are various proclamations and orders that have come down in the last couple of weeks, and it's changing all the time, so there may be more in the future. But right now, what's come along largely applies to Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and as we all know, MFTs can't uh, do Medicare services. Um, we may be taking Medicaid clients, but that may not apply to all of our clients. And basically, I, I will, I'll skip the legalese here, but um, they seem to have waived some things for physicians practicing in areas of great need during the crisis. But don't assume this is the case for mental health practice unless you get a legal consult that says, go for it, you can do it, right? Um, when in doubt, ask the state boards for the state that you're thinking you might wanna help out in or that you might wanna telehealth into and ask your professional insurance carrier. So when you do telehealth sessions, there's what you're planning for, which is like two you know, dressed people sitting on a couch, very much like we would see in our offices. Uh, and then there's what we actually get sometimes, which is, folks in all kinds of states. Um, in San Francisco, where I live, it is not at all unusual for people in their 30s, 40s, I mean, throughout their adult life even, to rent a single bedroom in a shared house because it's very, very expensive to live here. And so I have couples who I see where the two of them share one room and that is their only private space. So they don't have a couch in the living room to set on and have privacy because everybody else in the house uses that space as well. Um, and so they only have their bed to sit on. So I could get all kind of psychodynamic and say like, oh, that crosses sexual boundaries and stuff. Um, but if I get really picky about it, I'm not gonna be able to provide them telehealth. Um, also, I can tell folks, hey, you know, sit 48 inches back and put it on an 18 inch table because then the picture will be able to see you. But the reality is that I have folks who are sharing a single room, uh, a tiny studio, and can barely get far enough back that I can see both of them in the picture, never mind get the kind of ideal view that I'm looking for. So kind of like doing in-home therapy, because we, we are in a way in people's homes. There's what we kind of hope for as an ideal setting, and then we have to kind of take what we can get. And the start of sessions can be very chaotic. Unlike coming into your office where I usher them in and sit them down, you know, they may take your call and still have people running around. They may have other people in the area. They may take a while to settle down. They may have technical issues. And so just plan for this. Um, I know that people who have decided to space their sessions out a bit more because the possibility of technical issues and kind of, you know, needing to, to make adjustments and so forth is making them run late or not have breaks in between their clients, and so they've had to change their scheduling. But whether we're doing therapy in person or whether we're doing telehealth, the principles of effective couple therapy still apply. This is from a 2012 common factor study about what is helpful in couple therapy. We wanna change partners' views of the relationship, help them modify dysfunctional behavior. We want to decrease emotional avoidance. We wanna help them improve communication and promote a strengths-based view. Now, I uh, am working on becoming a certified Gottman couple therapist. Um, and you will see in the video that I'm gonna share with you, uh, me doing a number of different interventions from a Gottman perspective. But you can do this with emotionally focused therapy, with integrative behavioral couple therapy, with just about any approach, as long as you remember that these are your goals. And so interventions that I'm noticing that we you know, need to think about how we're gonna perform online. Now I said at the beginning of this that as of three weeks ago, I had never done couple therapy online. You might say, gee, Dr. Addison, why are you presenting this webinar then? Um, good question. Uh, I think because I've been doing couple therapy itself for a long time um, and I've been uh, using computers in all kinds of ways for a very, very long time since be, uh, almost some of the earliest days of the internet. Um, and I have done teletherapy uh, with individual clients for quite a long time. So when this uh, uh, crisis, I started to see it coming down the pike, I started preparing and said, I've got to get a sense of how I'm gonna handle this for my couple clients because that's the majority of my practice. So I did a bunch of uh, consulting with experts and some taking of classes and boning up myself. Um, and, uh, and so here we are. 
So um, interventions that I'm thinking about how to perform online, um, directing the flow of the conversation, doing that traffic management that we have to do, because couple therapists know if you just put a couple in the room and then you just kind of sit back the way you might do for a while with an individual, a lot of times you're going to have a car wreck. Either one person's going to do all the talking or they're going to try and talk over each other and there may be a fight, right? So you've got to do a certain amount of like, no, you go, you stop, okay, no, here's what we're doing, right? You have to be a bit more active. Um, a lot of couple therapy uh, uh, techniques uh, in, include doing enactments, getting people to interact with each other. And whether you have people in the same location or different locations, that holds true in online couple therapy. Um, we want to block unproductive interactions. So if somebody turns around and really zings their partner and says, well, you're just an idiot, we need to stop that because that's not going to go anywhere productive. Again, how we do it depends on our therapeutic approach, but we need to be able to jump in and intervene. Um, and then a lot of therapy approaches, although not all of them, use something like, you know, a guided conversation, maybe some kind of a handout or a tool. And that's true whether you're using mindfulness or something uh, CBT oriented. Certainly Gottman Method makes use of a lot of different tools or handouts. And it's different doing that online than it would be if you could just hand people something. So I'm going to show you some examples of those now. Um, this is uh, Russ and my friends Russ and Bart and myself. Uh, we're role playing here, by the way, um, as I'm, I'm sure will be obvious. Um, and I'm going to show you having the two of them seated at a table or a desk. But this is what it looks like when people are seated too close. That first picture I showed you of people kind of crammed in together. What happened the other day uh, in terms of you going to the grocery store? And I want you to make sure that you talk, talk about yourself as much as you can. Can you just turn to Russ and tell him what, what your story is? <laughs> Without hitting him in the face. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't even know how to do that without scooching away. Well, just, just, just talk to him as best you can, Bart. Um, don't back away. Well, this, this yeah, feels a little... Okay, well, so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just, I felt like, you know, you would have noticed that I went to six different stores and I, you know, did everything I could do to buy up every roll of toilet paper in the city and you got home and you were all pissed off that I put so many miles on the car, you know, and it just felt really... Um, shitty. And can you say more, Bart, about the shitty feeling? You know, can you can you tell him? Can you use some more feeling words there? Like, was would you were you hurt? Were you were you angry? Well, I, felt, I was. I was. Um, yeah, I was angry. I was sad. I felt really hopeless. I felt kind of abandoned. I felt guilty, like I'd done something wrong. Good, Bart. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so can you guys still hear me if I talk here? Somebody give me a yes in the chat box. Yes. Oh, great. sorry. Oh and, just, oh, and you can just say it to me too. That's right. Okay, so, um, and I'm going to switch my share back to my PowerPoint here, and then it, we may be able to just stick with that from here on out. So, you know, as you can see there, um, they were way too close, right? It was really hard for me to see any body language, and they could barely turn to each other to interact, um, which is, you know, I want to get people interacting in, in my approach to couple therapy. I want to be really dyad focused. Um, so here's what happens if we move them back a little bit, right? I can still see, and yet we've got some more space. Bart, can you, is there anything you that you one? can validate about what Russ was saying about, you know, his, his feelings, right, about the car and the finances? Oops. Bart? Sorry, we're on the couch here. This is what I want. So, Russ, you know, can you tell Bart, um, what do you, what's your perspective on the grocery store story? What happened for you, as, as you remember, and again, try to talk about yourself rather than rather than describing Bart so much. Where does the story start for you? Tell him about that. We bought the car. We agreed we weren't going to drive it for a simple errands like going to the grocery store because the grocery store is three blocks away, and especially now with 
you know, we don't know what our economic situation is going to be. Putting on miles in the car feels like yeah, we need to be saving money. We shouldn't be using resources. And and so can you so can you, can you put that in terms of yourself as I feel like we should save money. I was thinking about how our finances might be. Can you own that? Yeah. I am very worried about our finances. And I Good. And it feels like this wasn't in agreement with that, so that's why I was upset. Good. Good. And so, so you're saying, so you're saying, I felt, you know, I was, I was worried about money. And I'll pause this here. You can see here that, you know, because Russ speaks just a little quieter than Bart does, um, it's not quite as easy to hear him. And that's one of the trade-offs of when people move back, sometimes the mic doesn't pick up quite as much. Um, but, you know, I've had conversations with clients and said, you know, I may have to sometimes say, speak up just a bit uh, in a way that I wouldn't have to do in the office. And so far, it has not been intrusive because I have some very soft-spoken clients um, and they've handled it really pretty well. So here's what it looks like when they're on the couch. Bart, can you, is there anything that you can <laughs> validate about what Russ was saying about I'm going to skip past some of my lengthy instructions about the antidote to defensiveness, which is uh, some validation here. That he thought you had an agreement, right, Russ? You thought you had an agreement about not using the car so much. And when he saw the mileage on the car, he felt really worried and really kind of upset because he got the idea, oh, maybe, maybe Bart you know, isn't, is, didn't, didn't pay attention to that, isn't respecting that, right? And so he felt really felt disregarded. Hurt. Felt yeah. really disregarded. Yeah, great. And so, and, and so Bart, you know, is there anything about what Russ is saying, either something factual, like, well, yes, I did put you know, X miles on the car, or, or if you can step into his perspective a little and see how he might have felt, could, could you tell him anything that makes sense to you about what yeah. he's saying there. I mean, I get that. I get that. Like, you would come up and see the, the mileage and be like, oh, my God, you're been driving all over the place. Um, and that makes sense to you. Why? How does that make sense to you, Bart? Make sure you feel I mean, understood. Well, I mean, it makes me feel really misunderstood. It's, it's, I know. I don't, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. It feels like, you know, yeah, you're just making an assumption. You said, I, wish I you, feel, I, I, I get the idea, or I, yeah, so, I feel okay. as if, yeah. I good. feel, I mean, I feel judged, and I feel. Great. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to put this in I feel language. It's, sure, you're doing really good, Bart. And I see you, you're, you're feeling kind of defensive right, right now. Wait, what? You're feeling a little defensive right now, yeah? You feel a little criticized? Yeah. Yeah. Well, or, and, and not, it's, right. like, I wish you would just give me the benefit of the doubt. Like, why is of that course. the assumption of is course. Like driving around? So, remember, the antidote to defensiveness is first, you know, take any type, a little piece of responsibility what for what you can say really happened or find something to validate, right? So, like, you could say, it's true, I did put 36 miles on the car or... You know, um, I can see yeah, how if I mean, you thought I was if you thought I was ignoring our agreement that you'd be upset. Does anything like that feel like something you could say? Yeah, yeah, I get that. It's it. I mean, yeah, it's tough because I wish that you didn't go there. I know, Barbara. but I understand. Like, Good. if you go there, that that would be upsetting. That great. You know, assume that I'm driving all over the place unnecessarily that yeah that would be really upsetting terrific bart can you is there any so that's uh, me doing a four horsemen of the apocalypse intervention with them seated uh on the couch there and you can see that um, i had to do a lot of coaching there kind of side coaching in this intervention from bart uh in order to help him get off uh kind of the defensive stance now um 
I'm going to detrib it into a structured conversation in which I had to use a screen share um, because in the Gottman method we have tools like uh, this one is called dreams within conflict where we have kind of a scaffolding for a conversation that in, in a first face to face session I would hand uh, the couple actually a, a laminated uh, copy of this and so that they could use the questions to guide their conversation but I can't hand it to them in telehealth so what I do is I do a screen share just like I'm doing right now. And the downside of doing a screen share is that their pictures, as you're going to see here, get real small. Um, and you're going to see me kind of, I think, during this change up some of the options for how to uh, look at folks just to get some different um, views. But I don't get to see them as closely, but they can definitely see what I'm screen sharing uh, and use this structured conversation. So, um so this is the dreams within conflict that we've we've done before. Um, if you remember, so you're going to be the speaker, Bart, and and your job is to just make it feel really safe for Russ, uh, you know, to to tell what his experience is like, right? And and Russ, your job is just to talk about yourself as honestly as you can here, right? So what we're talking about is um, the idea of um, you know saving money for an emergency right and now the emergency is here okay so bart would you ask russ question number one yeah okay so um do you have any core beliefs ethics or values that are part of your position on this issue okay do i need to respond with things from the other no i just no you, you can just talk about whatever you want here russ um, yeah, I mean, core belief is to use as little resources as we can to save money, to uh, save the planet, um, and that means not using gas more than we absolutely have to. Um, Good. Good. And Bart, ask him if there's, if there's any kind of deeper value underneath that, underneath not using resources, saving the planet. Why is that so important? Yeah, what, I mean, I guess where, where does, what's that tied into? What's the big picture there? So, um, so this is the dreams. So um, as you'll see, because you can see them in two different windows here, you can tell the, this is when we've switched to them having them in two locations. If um, they were both still in the same location, I could keep one bigger window of the two of them uh, at the top. So I would have a little better view. This is kind of the least ideal setup here where they're on separate computers and I'm having to screen share because without the screen share, this is how it could look for me. And so I actually have a, a pretty decent view of them. Russ, can you ask Bart, um, why is it so important to him uh, that, that, you, that, you, that you really get um, his experience of going to six grocery stores? What, what, ask, him, ask him why that's so important to him, that you hear that story. Yeah, I mean, I want to know more about what your thinking was and why you did what you did. Good. Should I answer that? Yeah, uh, go ahead and answer him, Bart. Because I, I mean, I get what, what you're saying about, you know, that we're trying not to drive all over the place, we're trying not to use the car all the time. And so what I was trying to do was was, cons you know, like conserve us down. I, I get that I was driving around, but I was trying to like solidify resources so we weren't making a whole bunch of trips all over the place all the time, every week or whatever. I was trying to sort of stock us up so that we could just hunker down. Yeah. And that's, and it's important to you that he understand why. John, I want you to understand. I want you to why. understand that I, I feel like I'm trying to be the, a team player with you you know, and I guess I just didn't understand how it would look, or I didn't think about how it would seem to you if I, it, like, it makes sense to me that I could have called. Russ, can you? All right. So, um, so these were, this is the role plays that I did with my friends, Russ and Bart. And there's an interesting piece of feedback here that, uh, that kind of came up as we concluded this role play. And so I want to play this for you about the different kinds of configurations. 
having you both on the screen, I'm looking back and forth between you two, rather than talking here and then here uh -huh. and here and here, that this uh -huh. feels easier in some way and that I can see your reaction to what I'm saying. At the same time, I can see his reaction. Oh, interesting. Which surprised me because I really thought, oh, this is gonna feel alienated, that we're not having a real session because he's in a different room. Oh, interesting. But there's a there's a, a benefit to this also. Okay. I didn't expect what, that. What's your experience, Bart? Um. Yeah, I get that. I mean, it's weird to me if this was a if this was a live session. If we were, to, I would feel less connected to him. In this configuration. Yeah. Okay. Different experiences uh, then. That's, yeah. That's but I get it. I mean, I, it, it's both for me. There, there is the, an immediacy of he's right here and we're talking, but then it's not as this. This configuration feels a little bit more like a three-way conversation rather mm. than us. Uh, I don't know performing for you. And here's the thing: like I want in a in a couple session, I actually really want the two of you to be focused on talking to each other and yeah. not, to, and you know, using the escape of talking to me when it gets. Yeah intense yeah and yeah. so it's harder for me to know like it's actually impossible for me to know you know who is bart looking at when he says you know this is how i feel is he saying that to russ or is he saying it kind of over to me in a way that decreases the intensity so i thought this was a really interesting conversation because you know in a kind of uh, dyadic focused approach like gottman i want them to largely be talking to each other much of the time rather than to me and so the the, the dual location um, makes it harder for me to kind of watch that but um, as russ said he found it more uh, of, a, of a connecting kind of conversation. He likes to be able to talk to all of us in the room and I won't analyze, you know, Russ or, or Bart to their relationship because they're great guys, but it depends on the kind of therapy you do, which of the setups you might find, you know, more or less. Having you both on work. the screen. I'm looking. All right. So um, just a few technical things as we wind this up and we get some time for Q&A. Um, this is specific to Zoom, but I think generally across different products, you'll notice that there are different kind of ways that you can configure your screen. And it's not, I think, so important when you're working with individuals, but it is important to know how to do some of this management when you're working with couples. Um, and uh, so this is what's called speaker view where the program kind of natively picks up on who is talking or who has the mic and makes them big while the rest of us are small across the top um, and that can be useful for some things but when i'm trying to do couple therapy it's actually really not a very good setup because then i'm not kind of splitting my attention between the two of them when they're in different locations so this gallery view, which I got to by going to the upper right corner, actually makes us all the same size. And anticipating a comment here that's in the chat box, um, I can hide myself. In, in the case of Zoom, you, you do it through this drop down menu that appears in e the corner of each person's image if you hover over them. It says hide self view. And if I do that, then I get just Russ and Bart together. And that's how I want to make my screen look if I'm doing couple therapy. Sometimes the program decides to put them side by side and sometimes on top of one another, it may be the size of my window, I'm not entirely sure. But I want to have myself out of the way and the two of them together. Um, and if I am looking at the two of them on the couch, uh, I can be little on top like this here, which isn't super distracting, or I can hide my own image that way as well. Um, another tip is about managing windows because although we typically want to try to just be running our telehealth program for you know speed and everything like that, we also need to do things like take notes or pull up handouts. And so the uh, this tool that that uh, Zoom and other programs have, where we keep the pro keep the uh, window with the clients in it on top, is really useful. This is where it's located on Zoom under the meeting tab. Other programs might have something called pin window or um, you know um, prioritize window. Uh, but that way it's going to stay on top no matter what I do. And so here I've got 
two clients together. Um, they allowed me to take this photo, by the way, at the end of a session, uh, but I've blurred their images. Um, I have their window uh, pinned so that even when I'm over in Word to pull up a handout or to make some of my notes, that stays on top. And so I can write notes in Word, but I still can see them and it's not hidden behind the other programs. Um, for screen sharing, uh, so this is what it looks like in Zoom as I go down to the little share box and I pick what it is that I want to share. And here's where I learned that I need to share the computer sound. Thank you, uh, attendees. And so if I'm sharing my Dreams Within Conflict handout that's in Adobe Acrobat, I have to choose what I share. And here's a, a caution for you all. Notice how it shares everything that I have open at the moment, including my um, messaging app. Uh, let's hope I didn't have like something personal in there. Um, it, it does not show this to clients. And yet in the recording, um, I'm never 100% sure what gets retained and what doesn't. And there's always the possibility that I might accidentally click on the wrong thing. So make sure you got your personal stuff closed just in case, you know, you share your desktop and it has, you know, an embarrassing photo on it or something. Um, so what they are seeing when I'm screen sharing is kind of like what you're seeing right now. They're seeing um, the, the handout there. Um, and I can see their little windows here, but they're a little far over. So I can drag those around and make them a little closer. I can also do what you saw me doing in that little clip of video. Um, I can switch it from essentially a gallery view where I see both of them to a speaker view where I only see the person who is talking. And in this case, I was kind of switching back and forth as the two of them did this Dreams Within Conflict because there were times when I wanted to see both of them and there were times when I really wanted to focus on one of them. And I do that through that little menu at the top that the, the, um, whoop, that the red arrow is pointing to. Don't advance your slides too fast. Um, the green arrow, by the way, is pointing to a button that pops up when you hover that would allow me to mute one or the other or to kick them out into the waiting room if their connection was not good or something. Um, and this is stuff that's useful to practice with a friend before you do telehealth the first time. So um, when we're sharing, you know, I can make this bigger by uh, increasing the, the size of the uh, PDF that I'm sharing. Um, some, I've started bringing up some of my uh, key PDFs before my sessions, things that I think I might want to use with clients so I don't have to go digging around in my file system during, uh, during an appointment. And I can hide myself or I can show myself. You know, there I have myself hidden. There I have myself shown. Um, I don't have to be looking at myself through the session. Um, some people are really keen on the idea that, um, like in Zoom, you can uh, choose a virtual background. So uh, I could make myself look like I'm in front of the Golden Gate Bridge or on the moon or in front of the Crab Nebula. There I'm uh, showing a virtual background as if I'm in the kitchen of my office. But here's the thing with backgrounds. I'm going to show you just a little bit of video where we talked about. Do you have a green screen though? No, but you don't need it. Just like where you are, you know. See, here's the problem though that I find like if I move, you know, like my hands are disappearing and my nose yeah. disappears and it's a little creepy because otherwise like I, I don't have a shot of my office but I have a shot of our kitchen area. And I was like, mm -hmm. eh, except that I don't love the mailbox or my shoulder. Or like I have a melange of my office art but you know, I move around, I'm like whatever yeah. enough that I just feel like I'd look creepy, so. That's, that's why I have, I do have um, like several. I have this office and this office. Which you know, is if you move of, around, do you lose your oh, hands? Yeah, so yeah, my hands get all, yeah. <laughs> get all weird. Yeah, so um, you can get green screens to put behind you, but I have to say, I think using the, like, the virtual background without them um, for a therapy session might be a little bit weird. It might be different if you were a doctor just kind of sitting quietly and asking questions. Do you have a green Oops. screen? Um, I also want to mention, um, sometimes we need to connect more than two people, um, which you can do on uh, some programs and not on others. And I'm not the person to ask the definitive questions about here, but on Zoom, you can have up to um, 300 people on a telehealth uh, meeting. So you could do like a huge group if you really wanted to. Um, this is a hangout we had the other night with some friends. But so if I had like a non-monogamous uh, trio or more, um, I could have three people all in different locations if I wanted, and then I could put them in this gallery view so that, uh, so that I could see them all. 
All right, so some resources that I just want to share with you as we wrap up and then I promise I will take questions. Um, the uh, New York EFT folks recorded this great webinar. It's about an hour long about doing emotionally focused therapy with couples uh, in telehealth. And um, they supposedly have it on their New York EFT website, but I didn't find it so easily. So this is the direct link. And someone asked if you can get the slides. Um, I think we can certainly arrange that. Uh, probably I will send them to Dr. Bellis and then he can send them out to attendees. Um, but at Vimeo, and you can copy down that number, um, you can uh, uh, watch that webinar for free as far as I know. Um, I really highly recommend these resources for telehealth learning and for um, resources like forms and links to sites with more information. Person-Centered Technology, uh, who is a social worker in, um, in Oregon, I believe, and actually practices in both Washington and Oregon. Um, Simple Practice Learning, where our own Ben Caldwell, uh, who's an AMFT member, now is uh, running the continuing education. Um, Zur Institute, uh, which has a great deal of online CEUs, and then also Motiva, which I'll mention in a second, which is helping right now with supervision. Um, just to show you a couple of screenshots here, at Person Centered Technology, their front page right now is all kinds of free resources, um, including recordings of some webinars about telehealth. And then if you go up under the resources tab where the, the top arrow is pointing, that's where you can find reviews of all different types of um, uh, programs and apps and software. So if you go, what should I use to have my clients pay with? How should I store my stuff? You can get reviews of programs there. Um, Simple Practice Learning made one CEU course uh, on telehealth law and ethics free, and then they have two others, which are also one CEU each, that are just $19 uh, about different aspects of doing telehealth. Um, and the Zur Institute uh, has, uh, right in the center of their homepage now, has a special page about uh, telemental health and coronavirus. Um, they are offering discounts, as is person-centered tech, um, on uh, like a certificate kind of course. They have lots of free readings that you can access. Um, and so you can go there for more information. And Motivo, um, who has partnered with AMFT to connect people with supervisors, um, has made an offer that anybody who signs up to become a supervisor with them right now uh, can use Motivo for free to meet with our in-person supervisees. So Motivo is supposed to be connecting people who are meeting virtually for supervision, but because we can't go to one another right now, Motivo has said, you can use our service for free to do your supervision with people who would normally come to your office us who work you know directly for you um, which is a great deal so you can contact Motivo for more information about that um, and with that I'm going to uh, hope that uh, Dr. Bellis is still here and hopefully he will facilitate some questions and answers um, please put them into the Q&A uh, tool that you can see if you hover over the bar at the bottom of your screen thanks by the way everybody for hanging in through some technical difficulties Yes, thank you so much for um, presenting that. There's a lot of information there. And a lot of information. <laughs> a lot of information. It was very helpful. Um, I uh, certainly appreciated many of the different ways that you've described how to, how to work with couples. Um, so a couple, we have a couple of questions right now. Um, one that I thought was kind of a really important question was, um, so you mentioned about how uh, with uh, the, the clients that you should try and ask them to sit about 48 inches away from the camera in order to be able to see more of their body. However, for yourself as a therapist, do you have any suggestions on um, like a good distance for you to sit away from the camera or um, kind of like how we are right now where it's, you know, shoulders up, um, is that appropriate or should you try to um, show more of your- This is a great question well? because I think there's no right answer here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, ideally, and I'm going to move my table way back, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what we're talking about is that ideally, maybe I would also be far back, right? So that the clients mm -hmm. can see a bit more of me. Hopefully not the fact that I'm wearing yoga pants. I am wearing pants though. Um, <laughs> always, always wear pants during a session. You just never know. Um, but uh, the thing about that, and I could, I could yes. sit that far back if I had my headset on, but what I can't do is um, access my keyboard. So I could take notes on my notepad, which is actually what I do during a regular session is I just write all my notes by hand. Um, 
But if I were to need to share a tool um, or if I were to need to make some sort of adjustment like to the view in order to change, you know, how, how the, the, the view was going or make a technical adjustment, I'd have to be like climbing forward to do it. And I find it a bit awkward. Um, yeah. You know, I think that as we continue to explore what sort of things we can do in terms of just virtual connection in general and telehealth in specific, maybe there'll be a time when we um, go to a setup where like instead of having the laptop camera, maybe we have a separate camera that we really do sit back from, but then we can control remotely. Um, I think mm -hmm. that uh, probably would be a great kind of a setup to work on. Um, maybe what we have in like conference rooms and so forth, where there's a, a camera mm -hmm. that actually takes in the whole scene. But mm -hmm. we're working with what we have right now. So I think it's up sure. to you. Um, I'm just making do with them seeing me kind of from here up because I want to be able to manage the session. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so a um, couple of other questions. I know we're right at time here, so um, I don't want to go over <laughs> too much. Um, one person was wondering about utilizing the whiteboard in Zoom, like the whiteboard function. I have offers. not. Yeah, I know that it exists mm -hmm. and I have not tried it out. Thank you for reminding me of that. Mm -hmm. A whiteboard is where you could like write on something like it was a whiteboard or a chalkboard. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't tried it because I'm not, I'm currently uh, using, you know, um, a laptop with uh, just a touchpad and not like a mouse mm -hmm. or a tablet. And so mm -hmm. I, I kind of shudder to think my handwriting is bad enough. and I shudder to think what it would be like if I was trying to draw on the pad, mm -hmm. but that's a good uh, point. And you know, maybe I should set up a meeting and play with it a little bit and see what it's like. I don't yeah. think I would want to be trying to like write out instructions though. Right. <laughs> um, myself, I've done that with um, actually sharing my screen and using Word, um, believe it or not. Um, and right. one neat function uh, for those of you who do have uh, the newer iPad as well, you can do something called Sidecar with your iPad, which treats it as a second screen for your laptop or your Macintosh computer or your Apple Macintosh. Gosh, what is this, 92? And um, anyway, what you can do is you can load up uh, Word or anything else that you want in there, share that screen, and then you can use your Apple Pencil to draw on it. If you'd Neat. Like. Um, okay, two more questions, then we're gonna kind of wrap this up. So uh, one, somebody was wondering about the brand of Bluetooth that you were using. Oh, yeah. Because very good quality. <laughs> Great, glad to hear it. Um, you know, so looking on it, uh, they're failing at their marketing because, oh, there it is. Yeah, it's a Plantronics. And um, to tell you the exact model, I would have, oh, wait a minute, I've got my packaging right here. Let's see. It is a Plantronics Voyager Legend, um, wow. which uh, was around $50. And again, before kind of all the shelter in place, I, I'm a preparer and so I was kind mm -hmm. of thinking this was coming and so I um, uh, jumped up from a kind of crappy uh, USB headset to uh, a better headset and so I, I ordered one while I could still get them. I know some of so it, right now honestly some things like webcams and headsets mm -hmm. and stuff are kind of out of stock because everybody is trying to get online. But yeah it's a Plantronics uh, uh, Voyager Legend which was recommended because it has good noise canceling. So oh. great I'm glad to know it sounds good. Um, and then one that's, uh, the, this is the very last question, I promise. Um, it kind of combines several, but a, a couple of people are wondering about um, like specifically the handouts that you have and how you share those with the clients if you want to sure. give them to them. Yeah, um, no, I, I scanned those in from my Gottman um, um, mm -hmm. training manuals a long time ago because mm -hmm. I have them in session um, laminated. I bought myself a laminator and it was so exciting. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have them laminated in a folder next to me, kind of like we see Julie Gottman do in the training videos. Um, and so mm -hmm. I just have them as PDFs. I also have them, you know, on my computer because sometimes after we've done something like Aftermath of a Fight or Dreams Within Conflict, the clients will say, can we have a copy of that? Like, we want to look that over and maybe try that ourselves at home. And so that way I can email it to them. And so it's a saving grace because it meant when we jumped into telehealth, I've got them here to share. But mm -hmm. because I don't want to be rooting around in my files during a, a session where I'm trying to kind of keep the connection going, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's really important for me. To, like I've got some shortcuts set up on my mm -hmm. desktop to jump to some of those folders so that mm -hmm. I can get to them pretty quickly. Or if I have a couple coming up, I might open up two or three of the ones I use really frequently and just have them there. And then boom, if I need to share them, I can do it. Great. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Addison, for, for doing this for all of us. Um, I, I know that I found it very helpful. And, and by all the comments and all the interaction, I think I'm not alone in sharing that sentiment. A lot of people really, truly um, enjoyed this, um, got a lot out of it. Um, so just thank you so much for helping to guide us in this very difficult time as we're all trying to learn new well, things. Well, I thank you everybody. And um, someone commented in the, I see in the Q&A that, that mm -hmm. you know, observing how I handle technical difficulties is helpful mm -hmm. too. And I'm glad that's the case. Um, you know, it's a good reminder, like get on early and check your stuff, you know, but uh, Christopher and I were both going, what, how did we get this thing going? So, um, you know, we should have mm -hmm. checked all of our things, including the videos. Um, just like we do for presentations. So you know, hopefully that won't be an issue for you, but I know it's just really stressful and it's chaotic and we're all trying to like hold it together for ourselves and our clients and our families right now. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, the easier that this can be, I mean, I've wound up doing some like kind of handholding for folks and, um, mm -hmm. and I know that it's, it's scary, but actually I am really surprised that I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying the heck out of using my computer with family and yeah. with friends, like the hangout I showed a picture of Mm -hmm. and even to some degree with clients. Um, it, it, it's not the same as being in the office, but I think I'll probably, you know, never go back to just saying, no, no, I only do it face to face because <laughs> it's, a, it's a real gift to be able to be with people wherever they are. So thanks Absolutely. for the opportunity to talk about it. No problem. Um, so from here, just as a quick reminder for everybody who's still with us um, and those who are watching the video after, um, this is going to be posted to the Couples Network website. Um, so you can review it later on. Um, and also, as Dr. Addison was talking about, um, we're going to see if she would graciously share her PowerPoint slides so that people can have those links and those resources. Um, but other than that, um, we thank you so much for taking the time um, away from your uh, family and practice to uh, learn a little bit more about this. And um, yes, feel free to stop in and contact Dr. Addison if you'd like. She shared her email there. Um, I'm sure she doesn't want 900 emails, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, she is definitely one of the best people I've ever met in my life, and so. Uh, she will give up herself um, as she's able, but she does have good boundaries. So, <laughs> all right. I, I think a couple of answers here, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the name of the headset again for the person who asks is Plantronics Voyager Legend. All mm -hmm. right. Thank you for the opportunity, and everybody, Absolutely. take care, stay healthy, be good to yourselves, be good to your uh, good to your families. Um, take care. All right.